Well, let's coordinate to see where we are and uh, go from there. Okay, well, let's let's see where we are on the, the last few weeks of the schedule. So, I mean, last week we've been working on the shred, not shredder, but torch table plus the filamenter and um, the winder and pooler. And um, the status of that is is what we're still trying to get. Mm -hmm. Maybe a brief update on that. So Looking what, better than ever. <laughs> um, I mean, we had uh, we had two mishaps during the construction or the running of it where the filament melts in a too high of a temperature and it it carbonizes and it forces us to clean it up. So now it's clean as a whistle, ready for you know run number three or four. Uh, we have Wes's magical algorithm. Uh, keeping the temperature in check, which actually works much better than the controllers we used before, which I think they kind of caused the first carbonization and first clogging. And I've uh, cleaned it up, uh, embedded the thermometers closer to the pipes. And I think, yeah, what I have to do is just reattach the auger, everything's in place. We gotta try to dry out the plastic in the oven, let it sit in the 100 Fahrenheit or whatever in uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, and then do a run with that because uh, we can get filament coming out of it but it obviously has water bubbles or some sort of aberrations in the plastic um, so yeah we're doing, a, we're doing a new run and see what we get basically but I would say everything is, is having We've done, done several try runs. I think this this setup might just do the trick. I was curious about the rings that you all put on the uh, on the uh, shaft there. The plastic uh, bearing ring. Yeah, they're not on currently. Okay, gotcha. gotcha, gotcha. Those were for thrust. Like they were. There was a little holder where the shaft was prevented from going up or down because. Okay. When you're drilling into the plastic, it actually pushes it up into the into the motor. Quite quite a bit of force, like with all the re reactive force of all, of all the torque. Um, but right now, so the the shaft is just lodged in, and that's that's all we have. If there's any upward force, the the shaft of the motor is taking up all that force, which is so far has been working. So, yeah, no issues on that. Um, the motor needs to be so, needs to be secured. That the the plexiglass hatch or whatever you call it, and the screws that mount into the plate of the of the motor all need to be attached before you start running things. Uh, otherwise, it will it will break off the wooden part. Yeah, actually, because of, the, of those notches there, yeah, that plexiglass must be in place. And that's all we have. We don't have another reinforcing board. No, no we don't need it either. Uh, yeah. It works well with those. There is quite a bit of up upward force in the sense that the part right there with the notch there, the wood just broke. It went up, right? Mm -hmm. Did you replace that or just no, I told screwed, it, two screwed, two screwed, screwed it up? And I think that's ought to be twice as strong as was what it was before, because it was right with the grain lines the way it broke off. Yeah. Okay, so according to our schedule for for this week, let's see on a spooler. Are we we think we have all the parts and it's working? We just got to get it to feed properly and all that. Like, but otherwise the mechanical system and the triggers are all working. We got the the switch part, the reed switches, the two. Uh, I mean, technically they are working. Uh, running it last time with a very uh, varying uh, width filament uh, didn't really trigger it on and off. Now we have attached a fan right underneath the extruder, which means that the oozing plastic will firm up instead of varying and, and with, the, with the weight cooling down on it. 
So I hope with the, the thicker filament coming out through the auger, pushing it out, and also the, the fan cooling it, uh, I'm hoping to do a run with that and see how it acts. But technically, the spooler works. It spools up and it has triggers. Uh -huh. It might just be a, a, a thing of positioning it where it just triggers it right. But we set, up, we set it up on a table and such. And yeah, the only way to figure out is to, to feed the plastics, simply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to feed the beast. I said we try with like a spool that's already like just an office shelf spool, so you throw wrap them back up. We could, but I know it does. I, I already spool to uh, throw them in. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay, so according to the schedule, so CNC torch and shredder for this week. So we've got the now we're November first through the fifth week week of. Uh, so we're ready to start working on a shredder the cnc torch we're kind of wrapping up but we pretty much redid all the axes so that uh let's see let's look at some pictures but the system that we have right now is smooth in motion and took some data on the actual well, let's take a look at some more recent pictures here uh starting on cable chain pieces but here took some data points on the amount of force. So right now we have like 25 pounds of force on each axis about, it's actually between 15 and 30, depending on which axis and which direction you're pulling. If you're pulling where uh, there's like, it's not isotropic in the sense that you, you have less force in one direction than the other, simply because in, in one direction you've got all the belt to pull through and the belt stretches just a bit. So the force could be different, like it's, you know, between, say, 15 and 20 uh, or like 20 and 30 on the other side as far as how much force we have. And this one side, the first side, Y1 here, uh, let's see, what's the, what's the measurement right there? No, it's just starting. And that's, that's not a measurement. But uh, it's you pulling, right? It's not the pulling strength of, of the separate motors. So there's two things, two things we did. So one... One thing is, is pulling, getting a few data points. So we were interested in backlash, actually calculating backlash. We were interested in calcul or just measuring the belt tension. Like how, how do we know that the belt tension is uniform so you can actually compare and tell somebody to do it such and such tight. And the third thing was just the amount of push force and pull force on the axes. So here actually uh, looks like I'm pulling on the, the belt itself. The concept there was if you pull down on a belt like right next to the axis like a few just a few inches off the axis the the carriage you pull it down one inch meaning it hits the the steel bar how much force is required to do that and we were getting uh it, it was like 12 to 15 pounds in other words um in order to deflect the belt that much it had 12 to 15 pounds of force required so, I mean, you can't really translate to, oh, well, what exactly is the pulling force on the belt, but you can get an idea that if you get that measurement, you know you've done it consistently. So, say, on this side and the other side, and both sides were around that 15, 15 pound mark. So, we can say, okay, this is a consistent measurement that we're getting throughout the whole system. So, you don't, like, randomly have one, one belt tension some way and another one. At least you can get them uniform in that sense throughout the whole system. So, that was point one. Point two was actually pulling on the axis. So let's see if we got yeah, there's some more. And this was actually backlash. I'll get back to that. Um, so on this part here, is, so I put all these welding wire strings, but I just hung a wire, attached it to the, the carriage here, and then moved it using the controller. So here's the system. You just wind a wire through well here th this one here is measuring the actual belt tension i was pulling on that and here we're pulling on the actual carriage uh to see the the amount of force um that's the detail this system works pretty well there's uh, you tension it by screwing down the the screw and then tightening on the back with a bolt so that's good um but the idea there was measuring like yeah between 15 and actually 30 pounds of, of force on one side where say the motor is on the left hand side and you're pulling against this side meaning moving left leftwards here 
um, you're pulling on because the motor is on our left hand side here in this picture if you're pulling on the motor uh, to the left in this picture that means the amount of belt that's pulling is just that length between the motor and the carriage so that force would be a little stronger whereas if you're trying to pull the other way where you're trying to pull through the whole belt across the machine where it's got more like two meters of length and opposed opposed to like yeah, it's three times or something. yeah it's or just a little less force because the belt stretches slightly and you can see it actually when when I pull down on the belt like uh, by hand next to the carriage you can see between 1 to 1.5 millimeters of the belt actually the the shaft of the motor stepper motor spinning I took a just took a, a measurement to that in other words you're stretching the belt what's that mean the belt is moving along the direction of the, the belt and what that means is if that's the case uh, the little pulley you can actually see it spin a visible amount of degrees and just measuring it was between like 1 and 1.5 millimeters just using a simple millimeter ruler and that's with the system on? because there's more yeah. in the stepping motor when they're having well that's, that can be with them on because they're because they're they would be locked up if they were on so that, right. like without without any power you can see when you actually pull on the belt it does tension it and to the effect of a belt stretch of you can say because we're pulling a, a across the whole system and how long is the whole system it's like four feet twice so like eight feet almost three meters uh, when you pull it you're getting an overall one to 1.5 millimeters of belt stretch across the system so that's that's a real figure uh, what does that mean for backlash backlash is the inaccurate inaccuracy of reversing direction because you got things like like belt stretch and other inaccuracies like bearings maybe force against bearings and stuff like that um, that means that well if you for example if you're traveling fast and you're like you know moving back and forth yeah you could get that stretch of 1.5 millimeters if you're going very slow and the belt tension is at a certain value I mean you shouldn't get too much backlash from it and that's what that's where you want to tension the belt more and more so that the stretch it's already stretched out it's pretensioned so when you move it it tends to stretch less so you want this interplay of as tight as possible for belt tension but not so tight that you're putting so much resistance around the bearings of the shafts that it's just hard to move so this value of like 10 to 15 pounds was pretty good to still get as we noted like 15 to 30 pounds of actual force that each axis is moving that's each axis so we're getting like like 35 to like 45 or so or 50 uh, 30 plus 50 like, yeah like 30 to 50 pounds of force that you, we've got for motion so that should be robust that whatever we're doing with a torch table you don't have any any stoppage by some friction or whatever so it's, it's good good strength like it's actually hard to when you're actually moving it it's pretty hard to stop it you know, it's got quite a bit of force that's good and then we did this um, backlash measurement and uh, just to go with that so a dial indicator put it on so that's the carriage put a little uh, piece of pipe strap and bent it around so that the dial indicator uh, would touch it and then we moved it by one millimeter or so or ten millimeters and we looked at the dial gauge there so the gauge one big revolution of that is 0.1 inch on this dial indicator and we we're observing the values whenever we would move it forward and backwards we would uh, get the according amounts and the difference between uh, the amount you move one direction and the, okay say you do two directions consecutively in the same direction it gets you like okay here's the distance you're moving per step and we were getting values like um, in the actual system when you turn a knob we were moving by 0.1 inch on the one millimeter setting uh, so you do that now if you try to move it 0.1 millimeter uh, you can move it you would see like 10 10 divisions which means 10 thousandths motion every every time we stepped it but that's where you started to to get backlash visibly where you move it in one direction and then you move it the other direction and dial would not move that means you when you try to move it back like you took out all the stretch and inaccuracy and then on a second or third one it would go move back to that 
ten thousandth mm. motion um, after like stretching out the belt. This was on a 0.1 millimeter setting. And you, you can notice that like that's not 0.1 millimeters, like ten thousandths is not 0.1 millimeter because uh, 0.1 millimeter is actually that's a hundred thousandths. Uh, no, that's a hundred. Sorry, hundred microns. So anyway, there's a, there's a conversion factor between like what we're actually seeing on the dial and what you're turning on the on an LCD controller. Uh, so the LCD controller does not move in like when it says you're moving 0.1 millimeter or 10 millimeters. Um, it's not really doing it. It's like it's moving in gradations of like point th like it's not like 0.1. It would be like 0.3. So anyway, like there's a there's a calibration issue between like what you're actually trying to dial in the controller and what you see in the real motion. Just details here. But all said and done, we were getting on the one side we were getting actually 10 micron um, backlash, whereas on the other side we were getting no, not 10 micron. It was 10 10 thousandths on the dial. It was here is the dial shows like zero to a hundred, zero to ninety, or zero to a hundred. Each gradation is one thousandth. We were getting ten thousandth of a of backlash on one side, and we were getting about forty thousandths on the other side. That's quite good. That's all right. Uh, I mean, forty thousandths is what it's like. Uh, what is that in terms of? Uh, we were we're going like in the general torch table accuracy that we're going for like one sixteenth or like one eighth, one sixteenth more like. Uh, you you want your features that you want to cut to be pretty tiny. So so on the forty micron backlash you get, I mean that's le less than one thirty second. I mean what do you get? Forty, sorry forty thousandths, forty divided by a thousand. <clears throat> I mean that's point oh four. That's about one. What is it? One seven. One, it's like one thirtieth or so. One thirtieth of an inch. inch. Yeah. Okay. So one inch. That's the tiny, tiny thing. One inch is apparently twenty-five point four millimeters. Yeah. So it's like we're we're under one sixteenth for the the kind of a uh, backlash on the on the bad side and on the good side we're like. But more uh, like one hundredth of an of an inch. About that, uh, our firmware, since we changed pulleys. Yeah, we gotta change that. They need to update it to just reflect that, and the, but the consistency of it was pretty good, except for when it reversed direction. That, yeah. That first step of the millimeter pull of of, of one the new direction, uh, it left behind. But yeah, so that, it was pretty consistent. Here we're able to measure. Like here, we're observing that. Okay, yes, we're actually getting this ten thousandth motion, but on the controller it doesn't say 10,000 because there's calibration factors for the size of the pulley and all that kind of stuff which we haven't considered but the actual physical motion is your 10 to 40 thousandths of an inch so that's that's where our on that and all the axes are moving right along we're, we've made more of these carriages and where can where are we exactly on that right um, now right now we the the y's are out the x's are, are in as well so now it's just behind the z, z axis mm -hmm. on the x axis and we're using hollow rods on on the x and the z the y we just left the solid rods because they don't really affect anything in terms of weight because things are moving on them they're not being carried mm -hmm. whereas the x axis and the y and the z axis they are being carried the x is being carried by the y so we want it to be as light as possible for inertial effects you want the motors to have as much strength and not not counteract so much weight itself because weight would be friction against the the bushings against the shafts we mentioned something like friction of of bronze on steel is like 0.1 up to 0.3 or so so any weight that you have on a system translates to friction force that you have to overcome and our overall system weight here would be like 50 or so 50 70 pounds for the the x and z axis total it, it gets pretty heavy so um you want to minimize that weight and so we use the sh hollow shafts uh, using the other bushings that we had we had some other nylon bushings that we put into the carriages here uh, so that's where we are 
so now on a on a shredder, what's up with that? So uh, let's. I would suggest that maybe we um, you know, maybe get a team going on a shredder. Continue on a torch. The next steps on the torch are to look at uh, how do you generate the code. And I think there's a very simple way to use Marlins. Like say we have the blades to cut out. You can do. You can hack it by going into actually just use Cura. So you got your three-dimensional STL, and then here's one one hack. You can go into zero infill. Well, what does that do? That means it has no insides. It will only be doing the external the external contour. So so if you want an easy way to generate cut files, okay, take let's let's say um, let's actually show that because it, it's pretty useful to do this. So say uh, shredder. Let's see, can we find shredder um, let's take a blade out of the precious plastic shredder and see how that cuts up in Cura because I mean we're close to that we're close to actually running some test files. So first, just run the torch, no torch on, just see if it moves like we think it's, it wants to move. We have to get calibrated towards the different pulleys that we have. So that would be actually in the firmware in Marlin. We have to set the... Actually, we don't need to modify the... We can do that in start and then G-code. You can actually set the steps per millimeter in a start G-code. So if we run what we have on a system right now, just in your start G-code, we can say, okay, this is the number of steps per Per rotation and all of that um, so that's that's I'll actually for the blade yeah well, the shredder gears from the okay yeah let's let's uh, let's take a look at it if you got that right there PNG okay so where's um, Let's see what we got here. Well, let's take, okay, let's take like this shape here, for example, and see how it, any, really any one of these shapes and see how they, well, this is actually, that would be actually our spacer. So let's actually take that. Um, do we have any SDLs available here? Um, okay, let's do this one. So we download that. And then put it into into slicing. So what do we do here? Like, what if we do a hundred instead of a hundred percent infill? What if we do zero infill on this thing? Then what we should end up with is actually just the contour, and that's what we're cutting. Um, so say we go to zero here. Well, still the same thing. But if you look at the 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 layers view and then you shift down on the bottom you still have a bottom but do we actually get the desired outcome like say you go up in this file well it's got those various features but the red Oh, so it's actually got shell thickness of 2.4, so if we hack it further, let's go 1.2, and you get, should get a single line. Because we've got 1.2 millimeter nozzle size, shell thickness of 1.2, that means you should get, this is the actual contour you want to cut out. So what if we just go slice it, save the G-code, and look into the G-code and see if that, just extract one line where, so what you're doing here is you go and you, you Depositing this, then you move up to in Z, and then you go to the next layer, move up in Z. So what we have to do is, once we slice it, we look at, okay, let's take the snippet of code that's between where it increases Z, and that'll be one layer of this object. So that's a way to hack it. So now we've got the G code file for the, the actual contour that we need to cut. So, <laughs> so got this hex collar. Put on the desktop. 
because I'm you know what's the easiest way to generate this I, I think we could just do this thing so now we got this G code open this with a text editor Yeah. Uh, even if you know the shape that I'm doing is pretty predictable, say just like a square or something like that. Sometimes the, it moves up and down. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a pattern that it uses to actually implement that is kind of unpredictable. You know, like it's it's not just like doing the perimeter, right? Well, it what it's doing is the bed leveling correction, but that's a post processing step. The G code here is plain, but upon startup you have the calibration of the bed level after which it actually modifies all the code so it's no longer doing this but right here this is like the raw format that's just a plane without z jumps so this should work and we should test it because we're still going to use the z level correction we're going to have the probe and we're going to do the level the bed thing so it gets you approximately to well it will follow like if you know if your piece of metal is slanted it will just follow it at the right level um, so it'll still be doing that, but the underlying cut will be your, your plain flat shape uh, plus that adjustment that it post processes into the code. Uh, but let's see, so G1, let's see, let's, let's go down like halfway through, which we know that's like, yeah, that's probably where we want to be. La okay, actually it says layer 16. Okay, well I'll go to layer 16. It says G1, feed rates, E, E, I think, uh, what's, that's extruder. Now it goes to feed rates, X, Y, Z. Um, so it moved up this step right here, Z. Now it goes to outer wall. It actually tells you, so it's actually annotated. So you got feed rate of 2400. It, okay, it moved up again. Um, well, no, not it didn't move up. It's the, so it's extruding right now. So here you've got this series of G1, X, and Ys. That's going to be all the stuff that you want. That's going to be the outer perimeter. So that, there you got you got that. Copy it. And then what else we got? Um, and probably. So it did probably like the whatever the other features are. That was the wall. That's probably like maybe like the inner part or the holes that are in there. But it'll probably go like this. And as you notice, it's like it's got X and Ys, no Zs. That's that's cool. It's still at that same layer. Uh, and note that's also without the the bed leveling correction, which is not in the source code here. There's so one, there's one issue here. So then you keep going, keep going. And I would expect to go until I see layer 17 there. So all that is what you need. Now the other things like the different feed rates, we probably uh, don't just cut those lines out. Uh, it might be like a different feed rate for the internal features versus the outside. And here we're just cutting all at the, at the same rate. F3000, that's the feed rate part. Uh, so we just set the feed rate initially and so basically like all these these ones with the G1 X and Y Series we just copy that and that's that's our G code for the actual geometry and that's kind of a hacked way to do it But if we have the blade, I mean, it's a simple relatively simple Thing like all the layers like say we have a extruded, you know half inch blade, you know slice it down the middle Just take all all of a single layer and, and basically cut out those other feed rate changes and and uh, the E E parts, because E is extrusion. X Y E is not connected. So oh, in fact, yeah. Okay. Since E is not going to be connected, what, so what's going to happen there? It's going to think it's got the extruder, but it does. That's E, right? It's not connected, so it will just be making believe it's doing that. It will be sending those steps to the stepper motor. Yeah, so if you look at the detail there, it's G1, X something, Y something, E. So it's got an E line. We can just leave the E line because that won't be doing anything since the extruder is not connected. So we can hack it. That's like the simplest way, in my view. Like then, otherwise, I mean, of course we can do it. There's DXF to G code converters. There's free code, free CAD generation of, of cut files, little learning curves. But here we have this. 
where you just pull out the, you know basically one layer line from the code in in Cura and that's that's it. So that's one way to do it. Well, I think the extruder you might wind up using, right? Because I think the extruder is on Windows D8 and D10 and Kings. And I think we're actually going to need that to, to, to be able to automate the test. Extruder so as in the, the stepper motor? No, I mean, not oh, the stepper okay. motor. Okay, okay. Yeah. These are all like... Um, We're probably going to trigger the gantry manually. First test would be manual. Second test is like here you would do, you can do the D9, which is plain available. So there's one that's plain available. The easiest way to control it is you've got uh, start. Okay, so we what do we do? Step by step. We're ready to test this. We just run this. No gas because you don't want to be burning stuff bef you know, before you're hot. You're just testing everything. Make sure you got the correct. We did all the manual testing. Everything is still switched to be able to manually trigger all the solenoids. There are individual switches for the uh, turn on the gas, turn on. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Turn that's all that's all we gotta we gotta test all that with a new system. So yeah, basically, yeah. So so manual testing, uh, just run it physically, so you know you got the right motion. You know that you have the the bed bed leveling on one side, zeroing the axis, so you zero the X and Y, you zero the Z, do the bed leveling, then you watch it to make sure it goes to the right place, make sure that you can actually get it to the right place uh, in the coordinate system that we're using. Uh, probably convenient for us would be if we're cutting it out of eight inch wide, half inch steel, you just lay the steel bar across and do like maybe like three or four uh, blades at a time, because that's uh, for four or so blades at a time because that's how much fits across the bed um, or no actually I mean we could we could however we, we want to we can do you can lay one sheet of the the eight inch wide material we could do like two of them or we could even put like a sheet of material so we're cutting a bunch of blades from um, uh, from a larger sheet not because initially we were saying let's use the half by eight stock so we're cutting like, because we, we need eight inch wide blades. Uh, but actually thinking about it, it might make sense. Well, why, why do that? It's convenient because you can lift that, you can put it on there easily. Uh, maybe we do a few tests with it, but then when you're cutting, typically you want to cut out of bigger sheets so that you, know, you load it and you cut everything on a whole table. So you'd be like four by four blades, like 16 blades at a time, which is much more convenient. So once we shake down the whole system, Probably a good idea to start with, okay, we got the sample cut, we know, we think we know how to do it, and then then go to a bigger sheet. Now, there's weight issues on that, like the big, say, 4x4 four four sheet, I mean, of half inch, you're talking about 320 pounds now. So there's definite weight issues when you consider working with fatter, you know, bigger, bigger stock pieces. We could probably do something like, maybe do something like this wide, we just slip it in there, you know, maybe four of us carry it, or... Um, that's definitely an issue like at this level like when you have a full torch table working at the 4x4 four four or like 4x8 scale that's where you have to have a tractor getting and getting in there or some kind of a hoist mechanisms where you're actually loading in the metal because for half inch steel the full sheet is 640 pounds um, so it gets gets heavy at this point that's why we're saying okay initially we just use the the half by eight steel uh, flats which are you can take like a four foot piece and just load it on easily so it's easy to handle at that level and we, we can try that or we can try for a, a bigger sheet but the bigger sheet I mean we have to cut it first with a torch out of the four by eight sheets that we have because we can't do four by eight on, at one time uh, under this um, yeah it's not I don't No, it may no it actually may be just wide enough that we can slip the four by eight like lengthwise but only use like half of it so uh, Okay, actually, I think it actually is 48 wide. And then already. half stick out on the end? Yeah, like load it up so um, yeah. you load one half in and then you cut all that out and then slip the second half in. So that, that actually could, could be an idea. But, I mean, that's, that's challenging to get it in there. You have to get the tractor in there, like put on the forks and carry it in there and slide it in. Yeah, it's space -wise It's kind of heavy. Uh, well, we can move the torch torch table out a bit and such that we can drive in with a tractor like right next to it and then like push it over 
-hmm. into the table, into the torch table. But yeah, it gets into the material handling issues at this point. Do we have uh, available spacers for the bottom of the CNC table where the metal piece is going to rest? So we were going to do water table, like fill that thing with water so the bottom of it gets splashed with water so it cools. Uh, that was the idea there. Well, but well, we do... Yeah. I mean, as far as the height, we've got, in the current system, we've got seven inches or, of travel or so. So, I mean, uh, you need to be accurate, you need to be like, you know, within like an inch or so. We've got travel that mm -hmm. we adjust for the height. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, we, that's where we're at. You're saying we could put it on the bottom of, of the CNC table? You want to put it on the top, like if it's at the bottom, you will cut through the bottom of the table. So you want to have a space. Areas? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that you're cutting into air, but you destroy the, the bottom. you got to have water in there because it will yeah, just yeah, fry yeah. the metal underneath pretty quick. Um, yeah. yeah, right. So um, typically they have, what they have is these uh, just slats, and they lay, lay the slats on edge, and then you put the metal on, and they're, they're, they're sacrificial. After some time, they burn up, and they last longer if you have water in there. So... Uh, water is a good idea there. Yeah. One other thing is that if we hack the G code like that, it works whenever we're taking the signs that are in the, like the outer perimeter of it. Like if, if we load a G code of the latest sign we have, it's going to cut. Where we would add layers, it's going to cut layers, and thus it's going to be slightly shorter than it would be. So we need to take into account the width of the plasma cut. Yeah. Unless we can just make it consistent and then... then well, the width is consistent shots. everywhere. Like, if it's like one sixteenth of an inch or so, and then we just it's a minimal shots. curve. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the main considerations on the geometry is the 8 by 8 inch bearings, which we have, which means that uh, that's if they're touching together. Uh, so... I mean, as far as the, we talked about this before, but yeah, and then just looking back at the basic geometry, like what's, what's required? Because there's actually, I think the issue that we think might be troublesome is not that troublesome, but there's another issue that comes up. So let's take a look at this for a second. Um, Uh, yeah, so we talked about the spacer. Uh, anyway, that, that's kind of like all that we have. But when you... No, that wasn't... There was the... We had some more notes on the large 3D printer duck, didn't we? Let's see if we've got some of these notes here. I thought they were here. In here. But what's what's the consideration like in the uh, let's see. So you got this three inch shaft, so you've got the blades in between them. You want the teeth, there's spacers. Let's do um Oh yeah, I think we got, oh yeah, let's look at the CAD here, because we've got some of this we can take a look at already. Also, you got your blade. I mean, uh, 
the blade spacing has has to be such that when when the blades are coming to each other they're they're not touching they're not there's not going to be interference we we talked about that because this is half inch steel that that uh space and spacer every other so there's a cutting blade a spacer blade a cutting blade the thing is that one shaft and the other shaft they have to basically match up against each other so so that consideration is real as far as like this distance here i mean that we can control we've got you know under 1 16th control over the cnc torch table um so that that doesn't worry me but the, but the thing is here once you mount these so remember there's a tube that goes let's see do we have that tube there um no, we don't have the tube in here, do we? Um, That's in. So the square tube, the 4x4 four four tube that goes around the shafts and is welded so that these square cutouts go around the tube. Uh -huh. So that's an easy way to mount it. Okay, that's cool. But how do you space these out laterally that they're mounted right against each other? Because they are very tight against each other when they rub, when they're actually going past each other. Because uh, the this blade is not going against another blade it's going against a spacer isn't it yeah it's the shredding that happens between two blades um so how does the scissor action actually work it, yeah the lateral spacing between them the yeah so so the cutting action is so you got one blade here And this next blade here um, and the spacers the smaller spacers they're like here that's kind of what we have so this is the scissor action there that's the two blades scissor action between blades on each side of the blade because then you've got um, you got the next blade over here and the next blade over here so lining that see like right now I misaligned it right there right that alignment is what's important so how do we do that so we actually have to have an adjustment mechanism so if you got your three inch shaft here Them? You're welding the tube on. Tube is welded. Okay. No, but the the blades are loose. Okay. Okay. This is the square tube. Because we want to replace the blades. The shaft is like a permanent thing, but you want to be able to do things like use different blades, uh, just modular style. Um, square tube. Okay. So the first. Uh, so let's say there's the first blade right here. That you have to adjust back and forth this way precisely. You do have to do that. So we have to leave a provision because this is just loose on the square tube. But they are all punched against each other so the space is tight. And uh, so so let's, let's get the requirements here clear on, on alignment requirements um, there has to be a mechanism there where we have to control that space in fact precisely and how do we do that and that's actually doable through screw down action so let, let's take a look at it. but the requirement is gap this gap is consistent like this gap tiny gap and that's like ten thousandths like one hundredth of an inch gap like fraction of a millimeter uh it's like fraction of a millimeter gap that's determined by the spacer which no, is determined are, are well det no there is another spacer determined by spacer 
between the blades. Remember that we talked about that the other time. Yes, but, not... but they are they are the same width as the blades, aren't they? Well, that's the spacer. I'm talking about another spacer. It's a tiny, tiny thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little tiny thing there. Um, let's make it red. Because if you just put those like that, they might be rubbing. Now, maybe the first try is to actually see because of the inaccuracies. They may not rub, but they, they will. They're, I mean, it's half inch exactly. You're going to have some rub there. It's going to be very... Unless this is like precision machined, then no, just the tolerance is within the steel. Like maybe it warped a little during heating. It's, it's not going to be loose. So we need the spacer. between um, we call it let's call it a shim shim between spacers the spacers are between half inch spacers so this is this part here that's the half inch spacer um, make that that little one a little fatter that's the spacer shim that's the red part between half and spacers the purple part So we need something like this. Now, well, so actually, <laughs> number two, that's what, that's what gets you the fraction of a millimeter gap between the blades. Now, the second part is here this distance exactly like this has to be at a precise distance so that um, the blades fit exactly now how, how do we say this blades on each shaft are aligned to one another to blades on each shaft are aligned to other shaft in other words the blades must go in between the blades on the other shaft. It's got to have to happen. So, um, how do we do that? What I see is, is a possible solution. Let's see, there's our scissor action. Um, so, what I see here is a would be a collar. So a three inch collar. So this this we have out of stock three inch tubing, precision tubing. It's it's called drawn over mandrel tubing. So this precision tubing we have. Um, so this collar. Uh, to it we weld the plate like this. And through this plate now we can set bolts um, let's get a picture of a bolt So we can put in bolts like uh, through here. Now, what 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 else is required to make that work? You gotta you can do something like weld a nut here. So it'll be a nut, <clears throat> a welded nut, and then put a bolt through this nut. And now this bolt can adjust. Pretty, it can touch against this 
the first blade and adjust it. You kind of get the picture here. The angle of it or the tightness as well? Tightness. Yeah. Tightness. And so they're all punched against each other. They're located along the shaft in the proper direction depending on how much you screw it in. And same thing goes for the other shaft. You got to do the same thing, same adjustment on the other shaft so that you're now locating the blades perfectly along the shaft in the place they have to be. And they have to all be punched against each other, otherwise they're all like loose. Uh, I mean, you can punch them against each other by sending a bolt through all of them and bonding them together. Yeah. That's more work, it seems like. This, this little adjustment collar here, let's, let's get a little better, uh, better picture of that. So, we, so just manufacturability, we get this th three inch collar, we get half inch plate. Um, and then a nut here, welded nut. So like four welded nuts or so, like at 90 degrees. Uh, three quarter inch is convenient and easy to do and strong enough to get you plenty of force. So three quarter inch nut. And then a bolt goes into it. And now you can tighten down that bolt to whatever, to however you need to. So that's an easy way to do this. So this bolt will touch up. So it goes in here. So when we build this, we got to make sure we can get a wrench in there to tighten down this bolt. But the bolt would go like in there. So that's this kind of a, a tightening mechanism to adjust the lateral spacing. Got to do it. Um, this collar, now this collar also has to be located. That has to have a set screw in it. How do you do that? You can do keyways, which is hard. You can drill a hole through it and put in another nut and bolt through it clamp it down to the shaft or you can locate this if you don't clamp this down um, you can locate it right against the frame you can make this longer because the bolt, there's bolt heads here. Can do this thing, locate it right. So we're addressing how do you make that collar fixed? Because you got to fix it. Well, how about we bottom it out against the frame itself? There's the frame of the box here. So this gets. Remember how we were watching the precious plastic video of all their precision stuff? This is what we're doing here, uh, not by machining everything, but by using what we have with just like simple welds and three inch collar and stuff like that. So this is the frame, uh, the actual frame, the end, end of the box. Hmm? That was my thought, the whole thing is going to be in the frame. Yeah, it's going to be in, in a box. So you got this whole frame around it. So we can locate this three inch collar, bottom it out against the frame. Uh, you have this assembly here. Now you turn these bolts and they will pinch down on your on your blade assembly and give it the right spacing. Now the only thing is that the, the collar is spinning with the shaft, right? Uh-huh. What do you mean? That, that collar that we have on there, that, that's going to be rotating as well, right? Yeah, but everything is rotating. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, ooh, wait. Just yeah. Oh, yeah, you can't do that, can oh, you? Friction? Yeah, you can't do that unless you put the bearing inside. So 
So that's your shaft. Another point that we haven't addressed that, that might be obvious. It's bearing. Is that we need to be able to bolt on the side of the frame. Because all of these discs need to be stacked alternatively. So, and if we need to reassemble it, we will always need one, frame, one side of the, the box frame to be detachable. So here's the bearing, like the shaft comes, oh yeah, oh you're right, there, uh, ah, yeah, to, to get to get it dismountable, you have to end the shaft there. So you can loosen the bolts on the bearing, so this is the bearing here. And then the bearing is the thing attached to the frame. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. If you get rid of these bolts, you can pull out the rotor assembly. Yeah, but yeah, that's the kind of complexity we have here. So yes, if this collar bottoms out, it can bottom out against the bearing and spin with the shaft. Right, right. Um, so there's the rotating collar of the the bearing, and then the collar would be right against it. So this this and that that's the bearing here yeah that has to clear the bolts this to be right next to it <clears throat> and then so this collar is spinning everything here is spinning uh, including this collar because that's the bearing and then the shaft ends before the frame. You can, by taking out the bearing bolts, take out the entire rotor assembly. Yeah. That's what it has to be. So there's the blades. There's the square tube that's welded onto the three inch shaft. Uh, the consideration is that the shaft, as we mentioned now, has to end before uh, the frame. So we got the frame here. Well, the bearing, the bearing here has to. Yeah, shaft ends before the the frame, so that if the bearing is on it, yeah, the whole thing can slide out. Um, yep. This is uh, this here. That's not too hard to do. It's like as long as we have the collar welded onto this plate. Well, the collar is already precision. That's precision steel tubing. And then the bolts, they have very fine adjustment. So, you know, however you turn it, it's, you know, well, we millimeters these, of adjustment. We want these bolts to basically adjust the angle of all... It's not the angle, it's not... I mean, it is angle. If you press them together, they're all going to flatten out and yeah. be 90 degrees, so... Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but it, it is a lot of weight. Uh, you it is a lot of weight in there. two of them with two people at the same time. Well, the tires... Collar, the, the shaft assembly, I mean, the three inch shaft itself is pretty heavy. Then you put in all these blades, this is going to be very heavy. Several hundred pounds per, it's like 400 pounds per rotor or something. 300. Depending how, I mean, we'll start with a few, few blades, but the shaft itself, right now we have like three feet or so, but that weighs 30 pounds a foot. What is the so length? it's 100 pounds right there. What is the length of the shafts that we're, what is the length 30 of the inches. Area? Uh, so the shaft is 30 inches, so now we've got minus the width of the bearing, so now we've got about, you know, 26 inches. Uh, there were 30 or 36? I think there were 3 feet, so we've got like 30 inches of cutting area minus, minus the two bearings. Uh, min well, minus the collars, so it's yeah. like there's all that space, so we're going to end up with like 2 feet or so. So one thing we thought about was just putting weights on like a third of this shaft. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Um, oh, oh, but th in that case, the tightening mechanism doesn't work anymore because you'd have to the square tube would have to be uh, shorter. So, the way you can do it is you can put a you have to put like a big tube around the square tube, and then uh, so use your collar on the other side.
you'd have to do a spacer between that if you were to do a partial fill of the blades so um, Uh, some kind of a spacer would have to go around the tube if you only got a few blades. Do we have tube like that? I think we have. We do have like big, probably something that fits around the four-inch shaft, which is the the four-inch square tubing. Um, what do we have there? We do have like, and then we have some cylinders there are five inches but that's not maybe too small yeah that is a challenge though because uh we we need something uh that something could be as simple as four uh so if you've got these uh bolts that are press supposed to press you could do now it's hard because you have to have four four spacers of the same length yeah um would there be a point to make the whole design shorter? I mean, the point is, for simplicity's sake. We want to make it. Well, we can do is we can if we want to do what we want. So the square tube that we weld on, we just weld on us, you know, a little bit of it, like one third of it or something, and we can still weld on the rest of it later. Uh -huh. So we can just cut that square tube and make it sh way shorter. So we still have the shaft. I mean, we don't want to cut the shaft because then you kind of throw away the shaft. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, square tube, that's useful in larger or smaller pieces. Um, we can do something like a small section of this, but this all like if we're if we're going to be able to cut, cutting four versus twenty is not big of a difference because I mean the cut is going to be like five minutes a, a plate or something. Yeah. So, <laughs> what yeah. I'm afraid of is that we power on these powerful uh, hydraulic engines. Uh, we we miss noticing that there's a slight um, snagging between them, and then we have a bunch of metal just jamming into itself. So that hydraulic engine is strong, right? If it's They're fifteen thousand inch pounds <laughs> each, meaning they've got at like. What is that? Uh, we got say eight inch blades. So at the four inch tip, you've got like three to four thousand pounds spread over all the tips. But yeah, three thousand pounds pushing against each other. That's a lot. Now, if you snag on the metal, that's the metal's going to stop it at dead right there, and it'll fluid bypass in the hydraulic system. So, I mean, the metal is fifty thousand psi. So if you snag a little bit, that's gonna stop it. It's not, it's, it's not gonna just like push it up. It's not gonna like shave it off. It's it's too little force for metal. It might take little little slivers, tiny slivers, but not too much. Um, so it'll probably just jam up, which is fine because we just set the pressure bypass on the hydraulics to be, you know, initially when you're testing it, set it at a low pressure so you don't have a lot of force there make sure it's all smooth so set it like minimum like you know 500 psi or whatever because it's three them on the lathe if we had a, a well i mean you can spin them by hand initially mm. if the motors are not attached you'll you'll just spin them by hand and make okay. sure that they're yeah. moving so that's the first step yeah take a pipe wrench you know move it around make sure it yeah yeah that spins around good. yeah yeah so as we test that so that that's that um, kind of the process there, so that's the shredder CNC torch. So I mean, I um, could continue. Maybe maybe I could start on the shredder and uh, get that. But I mean, we want to cut it up a little little bit here. We gotta. That would be very useful, so that we know everything's gonna fit, like all the dimensions. Um, got a basic shape here. We want to insert that that collar thing. Move the move the bearings probably inside. Um, take the measurements of like exactly what we have like that we got because we've got fixed things like there's x inches of shaft the bearings are so and so so we can actually get a an accurate uh, representation of that first yeah uh, so how do we divvy up 
divvy up the work. So we've got work continuing on Torch. Can you can continue that? Yeah. Yeah. Campus, you want to uh, continue on uh, yeah. Filamenter? Almost there. We're we're at making the Z axis happen. So the Z axis, we've got all the parts for it, yeah. and we can mount it. Uh, and then the, it's pretty much about building and attaching the Z axis at this point. So that's where we're at right is, there. Is that the same? The gantry is the same design as before, except the hollow rods. No, we we did the we redid the Z too. So it's okay. got the good axis. Okay. The, easier it's I mean it's much easier to mount like very accessible bolts and stuff um, the way it looks right now is just to show where we're at on that So that's, I mean, so we, we migrated to yeah, remove the frame here while well, looking at this is from the Y1 side. So that's, that's how it looks right now. We've got this system here with the belts and so we see the three bearing holders. Uh, which are easily loosable for any tightness. Yeah, same on a Z. So we're mounting the Z between the two two X axes. As far as the spacing between the X axes, so you've got it on already. We've got about six inch, such that there's six inch space between the two. Did you actually end up measuring what we ended up with as far as the space between the two? It's uh, the is I don't know. It's like about uh, an eighth of an inch. Um, on either side of the okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe about six and a quarter, six inches. Or yeah. Space. So the way we attach it, drilling a hole through here and pre-drilling a hole through these bushings here, which are solid plastic, we should be able to just get a simple screw in there, mm -hmm. uh, like M6, or or you could even do a deck screw, which has got 300 pounds of holding strength. So here too, there's this partial, this half, half kind of a bearing holder thing, which just serves as a mounting point. So here, there's going to be a bolt through that little hole into the Z, Z carriage. But as far as the X carriage, we drill a hole through here and mount into that, and then mount into this other purple one on the bottom here. So four-point connection. Two uses using two of these existing bearing holders which you can just drill into they're solid solid plastic and then um, yeah what do we have here so the Z Z motor on top it'd be nice to have something some way to mount the um, basically the uh, that, uh, the spark gap generator onto the uh, onto the Z axis somewhere as well because the, the leads on the yeah, I mean, there's plenty of space here if we need to yeah, do any mounting. So, so components like that could go on here. We can have the the gas solenoids mounted here. On the bottom, you'd want to have a metal plate around the bottom surface, so you, as a heat shield. So just screw in a a metal plate. You can easily do that through this solid plastic, uh, which is the bottom bottom idler. Uh, the relevant thing that's absolutely needed for startup is is the Z probe, which we could attach it to, say this bottom plate here. But you want to make it a uh, retractable, meaning just fold up or like slide up on a rod or something. Where once you get the Z measurement, you want to get that out of the flame because uh, if you want it to be as close to the cutting tip, 
but once you're cutting you don't want that to be close you either have to shield it or just fold it up just I would just manually fold it up so it's a uh, kind of like above the above this this plate that we would mount here It would be a good idea to insulate it, indeed. Ideal thing would be to have a standoff. So say you use a, maybe an M6 bolt, but you can screw it in. So uh, just to draw that up real quick. So say you got uh, this bottom surface do a threaded either that or like threaded rod where so you got your so you got your uh, screw or something going in here and put like or threaded rod and then if you put a nut on it there's a standoff so there's an air gap here uh, so you'd have say a, say a nut here and then your plate underneath it. Yeah, you don't, you don't want that plate to be directly against the, the metal. So the thinner this is, the less heat conduction. So ideally, you know, like a quarter inch, quarter inch bolt would be good, or quarter inch threaded rod. We can uh, pre-drill like a five millimeter hole and thread it right in. There's space, uh, there's meat there that we can do that in. So then you mount your plate next to it and in fact like you know do do a couple of inches of space there so that when um, uh, things getting hot you've got say two inches of clear space there maybe put in little fans there too or something if you want to do that but we can definitely do it you can even do things like multiple plates like say you got one plate a nut and another plate so you just got air airspace standoffs uh, between that, so kind of like a heat sink around around this area. Uh, PLA is low temperature, like for real, we'd want to do it out of ABS or polycarbonate um, later on. Uh, yeah, I don't think that, that would be a production machine with PLA, which is very low low temperature. Yes. Uh, so that would be an upgrade, but or possibly getting this, maybe getting away from plastic altogether for this part and actually doing some steel there, uh, which would be. Ah, but I think with a with a sh heat shield, I think we're pretty good. Um, could put like a few fans in there or heat sinks if we if we needed to. Like imagine uh, a bunch of the same fans that we have on the extruder and the heat sinks mounted to a a plate underneath here. So you're just blowing that heat out. Each each little fan is like 40 watts of cooling power. So uh, that's significant, you can say. Uh, and uh, like the worst case scenario is like actually water cooling, but that's that complicates your system quite a bit because then you'd have to be pumping water around your electronics here. But uh, some people do it. Some people have water cooling in these kinds of machines. So, uh, but hopefully not. We wouldn't need it. I think the standoff here would be a good idea. That would be an easy solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. These are the so yeah, the actual on the we ended up going with the auto parallel mechanism on the left on the Y1 side here. Why? Why do we do that? Because the motors don't fit on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because we've got these bolts, 
yeah we forgot that we've got these bolts here like this bolt this tensioning bolt so we couldn't get around that we need a little space for the motors to stand off from the the this plate mm-hmm so the the Y auto parallel is on Y1 we initially had it on on Y2 here it's mounted directly to Y2 as you you see here like if we had a motor there that bolt is in the way so that's why we couldn't do that mm -hmm. so that's what we got um, so I would suggest I, I could probably work on a uh, work on a shredder part um get on a torch then hemp us on the on a filamenting and Emmanuel what would you like to join up on well, let's see uh, thinking about our process this week um, what aspects of the shredder can be assembled before the blades or do you need the actual structure that are things that mounts you yeah. We need structure, um, table to, to hold the structure on, there's the hydraulic motors that have all the fittings, um, main is the, the box shape, getting that, cutting out the uh, bearing mounts, uh, cutting the tubes to size. Now that kind of depends on exactly what what the dimensions we are, and we should take it to the CAD a little bit to to get the exact dimensions of what exactly we're cutting. Um, let's see, as far as the bearing plates are, we're using an eight-inch box, so we're looking at an eight-inch box here. Now, underneath it. Uh, after the blades are in, we will have screen at the bottom, so there's going to be a little standoff for the bottom. Uh, if we put on a table with like a doesn't have a surface, like the stuff can fall. There could be a box or, or catchment catchment basin underneath this. But going through the uh, the screen, where the screen would be uh, welded on to like a, to co conform to the shape of the shape of the rotors so kind of like a half circle shape screen that kind of weld uh, there's the yeah there's the assembly for the tensioning the blades together but yeah we could uh, it's largely dependent on, on doing a little bit of CAD work to make sure it all fits Yeah, so that'll be half by eight. It would be convenient because since the blades are the bearing the, here sh shown as eight because the bearings are eight inches from top to bottom. I think there was an accurate rendering of those. Yeah, those are pretty much eight across. I can verify that. Yeah, so so if you've got eight and eight, so here it's sixteen, and what what's shown here is probably representative of what we want uh, as far as the length here. The, sorry, the width, which right now we've got eighteen. And the, the overhang on the, the Say it again. Yeah, 18 inches on each side, yep. Maybe we should wait with the short sides of that until we have the blades done, or? It would be better to, to have the blades exactly to dimension to see how, yeah, what they look like.
Yeah. Yeah, dependencies really getting all the measurements tight, getting a good cut list. Um, so want to measure measure up all the components like uh, there's uh, one part that's that's relatively known as the mounting pattern for the the motors because these motors have to be mounted very tightly to the to the base surface too so that's a four four bolt pattern and that would be similar to what we're doing actually on the tractor where we did a basically a mounting plate for the hydraulic motors uh, that would have to be attached to to the bottom the bottom here to the, the table that we're sitting on um, so that would be some kind of a mounting structure but knowing that there's a bolt pattern for that so that's that's something that's doable yeah I mean yeah we gotta draw draw this up a little a little more on the CAD I'm not sure how accurate those uh, dimensions are to the actual coupler so take some measurements and And work out more details of dimensions. Mm, what's the best way to to do? Like, probably assume um, the connection. So the connection to the table has to be pretty stiff. Like there has to be a very stiff connection to at least where the box starts. Yeah, I think we have to design that a little more. Because uh, you can't just have these motors kind of like free, free hanging there. That's that's a lot of force there. They they gotta be gotta have a good firm attachment. Like if there's a idea, we'd <clears throat> possibly do the box and then an extension of the box as a way to hold it, so you don't have to um, maybe like if these sides extend quite a bit, um, or make uh, possibly make tabs here. That then once we have the the mounts for the motor, the the motor actually attaches to the tabs, of of the extension of the the actual solid box. That would be a good idea because then you're bonding the the actual box with the motors, which are the structural things, as opposed to relying say on a table, a table for your structure. Because then table's bigger. We already have this steel here. It's convenient to use the solid structure that we have already, which has to be structural already. Uh, to probably extend for the motors, uh, this may be misleading here as far as what that what the required distances is, because these motors don't really represent. I don't think they're accurate representation of what we actually have. This mounting plate here might be much closer to the box than we think, in which case it does make a lot of sense to connect to the box itself. Uh, so I could definitely see something like an extension of an eight-inch plate going towards the back, towards the motors. So we can actually make an attachment to an extension of the the box. Yeah, yeah, we got We gotta get some measurements and get get firmed up on the measurements on what things would look like. Yeah, it's basically drilling four holes. Okay. Yeah. Do you have the Z-axis already? That's right. Already. Um, do you have the Z-axis already assembled, or? Um, no, because uh, I wanted to drill the holes first. I did uh, mark out where I wanted to put the holes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, based on your on the CAD. So, so, yeah, so I wanted to drill the holes first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The whole gas is from the solid one to the tooth and all of that stuff is completely disassembled. Yeah, um, 
So I noticed there was the original solenoids, and then you guys started doing the the other three. So what was the idea there? Uh, I think the, uh, Volker had the idea of like light making because the uh, older solenoids had the additional sort of uh, metal fixtures that they were attached to, and so Volker's whole concept was to completely lightweight the Z axis, and so he was suggested using the other solenoids that were more sort of freestanding because they could just hang with the, uh, the tubing itself, and they didn't have to be actually attached or supported. Still have to have firm connections for electrical, though. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Yeah, yep. Um, there's also the other part of cleaning up the controller so that we can do, uh, continue to do it like well organized on a nice panels because uh, that will help all the routing and everything else. Like cable routing is going to be very important to get everything um, functional and, and routable. So both for gas and electrical, um, <coughs> there's that part. Do you want to work on that or? So it's more just uh, the motor wire that needs to sort of be uh, put Yeah. So I mean, we have the the pattern for I mean, pretty much exactly the same copy of what we have in the current system um, on a on a 3D printer, there's a AC solenoid on it. If we replace that one with a DC one for the gas, then we have the basic control on for the for the cutting oxygen. So uh, probably the best best would be so manual, just manually. We have the torch. We can test with that to automate it fully. Then uh, for the cutting, uh, sufficient. It would be pretty sufficient to do just the the cutting oxygen because um, that's the easiest system. And then we can, I would start with that and then if we want to do the other two gases, but that, that gets a little, it's doable, but I'm not sure if it's worth it for the first, uh, just for the immediate run, because just w one versus three of them, it makes it, one makes it much easier to implement with the one solid, with one relay that we have. Um, so that should that should be in the shop. So we got some DC relays, same fo form factor uh, as opposed to the the AC one. Uh, so if we do that, then um, we can be pretty close to testing it. Uh, the first thing is, yeah, I mean, just get the motion. So after get getting the motion system up and running, just test see if we can get the s some sample G code files and and run it. Uh, but we do have to do the calibrations for the the motion, like the Z steps per per millimeter. And that, uh, how do we do that? What's the procedure for that? You have to measure. Yeah, I mean, because now, now we, we have a different amount of, uh, the pulleys are a different size, so the, the z, sorry, not Z steps, e, uh, steps per millimeter on the X and Y and Z, which are all the same, because we've got the same pulleys on all three axes, but that's going to be a, a simple factor uh, we can start probably by saying, okay, we used a half inch, now we're using the 0.74 one inch or whatever we're using right now, uh, based on, it's in a document actually, it's, um, we have the pulley specs, so you can start by saying that's, that's the factor difference between the pulley we have now and what we had before. That's a good initial start and see if we get pretty accurate results, like if we say we move it however much, like 10 centimeters, are we actually moving 10 centimeters and stuff like that. So you can measure and adjust that value slightly um, 
until we get it as accurate as we can. So ideally move like a long distance, say like, you know, half a meter or a meter, measure exactly what you got. Do we get one meter? Do we get 99 centimeters? And so forth. So, so, and then we adjust the value according. But that's doable in a startup, start G code. Um, yeah, you can do that if you, but since you're going to have to be re uploading a few times, it's probably easier to do it within <clears throat> just the start G code. So you don't have to keep re uploading stuff. Maybe figure it out because that, that might take a few, few tries to get it, get it exact. I also save some time by doing that. Yeah. Um, Yeah, all the motion testing. I mean, even even right now, we do have X and Y already. I mean, maybe you can start, do the slice, do some sample files and see if you're getting the motion, no? Uh, or, on, I've actually disassembled the, or rather removed the carriage, the, the X carriage, because I have to drill a hole. Mm -hmm. I have to drill a hole through, yeah. So... Uh, you want to drill in place? Uh, yeah, I could. <laughs> Should be able to do it. I mean, that's one inch rods there. Um, yeah, I mean, I would I, do it I in did, place. I did do, if I, I did, were you, but I did do one uh, x axis in place uh, using uh, just the hand drill. Yeah, and it was pretty, it was pretty tough. Tough in terms of getting the amount of force on it, or yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So that takes some time to get up to get up to speed on the uh, free cat so that I can be helpful in updating the Yeah, yeah, I mean there's once a, like with the free cat the parallel workflow the idea there is what we practice is the is the interface design idea. That means you know there there are certain known things about the whole system when you can define okay this is the blade this is how it fits on the tube like you can get that broke break down the whole design into a whole number like for basically for each part exactly what where is it how it fits and you can do a design process with multiple people doing that so we can definitely uh collaborate on it because it's uh, once again a, a total modular breakdown if we define the interface between two parts, then then two people can work on the designs independently. So that's that lends itself to to yeah, the parallel. It looks like right now in our workflow that the, uh, the shredder, getting the shredder started, is probably where I could add the most value. And it looks like the, uh, the dependency is being able to sort of rectify what we physically have, you know, known with the components that we're using versus you know, making the adjustments in the CAD uh, and then being able to film, finalize some of the, uh, the design elements of the track. And so I think I should get up to speed on using FreeCAD, you know, take some measurements with what we have here and then start seeing if we can get a unification of what's in the shop and what's on the uh, FreeCAD. Yeah. Like yep. And the file. <laughs> <clears throat> so the file. Um, so that would be OSC Shredder, uh, just so we're on the same page, uh, file name is OSC Shredder, no. page name. So CAD is here. So yeah, the the overall file we just got one file. We can start breaking it down into individual pictures. But yeah, um, download it. Um, I'll work on it on that as well. So 
Uh, basically, the procedure is just as soon as you have anything, upload it. Um, components or the final final design, just keep uploading on a regular basis, and you have to wait to finish it. It's also a good way to save files from your computer in case you crash and stuff like that. But um, why I do it is. As soon as I have a change, I, I keep the log of, okay, how did I make the changes? Like, for example, uh, on a torch table, I think that's a good example to take a look at. Um, for example, if you look at the final assembly, both the file and the picture have, have histories. So if you look at the picture, you can actually trace what happened here look at all of that so basically uh, you know, starting with this and the various additions and happening you can kind of trace you know say from here yeah just doing a visual record of what, what happened like initially for example um, yeah started with the y-axis and kept moving and, and and this actually does show the progress of one thing after another like for example the the Z mounts were added in this file version and stuff like that. I'm just continuing. And the same for the. Uh, and how do you do it? You just simply click on the image here. Then you go file history, just upload new version of this file that's useful. And then for the actual CAD, what's useful is you uh, once again upload new version of the file. And there's, yeah, there's like a whole bunch, and then a comment like when you, whenever you, whenever you click upload a new version of the file, you select the file, but also it lets you do the file changes notes, so you can put a few notes in there, so it's kind of transparent. Because because unlike software, this is actually a little different, in the sense that multiple files are useful. Uh, some files might have the full detail, others might be like super stripped down versions because if you want to do a master assembly full detail files would just make it too large and you won't be able to work with it. So here we save uh, different versions. Um, it's not super visible in this final assembly but in individual part files that's where it's important you have like the full detail file like say even with threads which take a lot of memory but then you strip all that detail down if you want to work in a larger assembly where if you had if you didn't do the simplifications your files would be many many megabytes and be super slow and stuff like that so uh, in this kind of process we, we save we can save different versions of the file like it's not just um, the production version there might be some variations that maybe we're testing something out it doesn't mean that like the latest file is is the master even it could mean that okay we're going that but going with that direction but we can actually go back to former files and say oh, okay well I actually like that maybe I want to start from there and stuff like that so so there's multiple files which is a little different than the, the software route because typically it's like you got the whole just like that one one version that people are working with uh, process is a little different but but we do want to save like as much of the process as possible and study the history uh, for what's been done yeah All right. Yeah. Let's get out there then. Okay. It's been a long time since my day is working. 